Here we're going to go over zeros and poles. To motivate this, let's consider a differential equation of the kind we've seen many times before, or its transfer function. To solve this, we find the characteristic equation, and the roots of the characteristic equation are given here. And this is what we mean by poles, namely the roots of the denominator of the transfer function. Our next step is to find the homogeneous solution, or the transient portion of the solution, which is the form of an exponential that decays with a sinusoid inside, where the decay of the exponential is given here, and the frequency of the sinusoid is given here. Then we find the particular solution, which if we were to apply unit step, we know the particular solution would be a constant, and we can easily solve for what that value is. Alternatively, we could just use the Laplace transform with initial conditions, and you know how to do that. You have to find the partial fraction expansion, and then you'll have some constants a and b that depend on the initial conditions and on the particular kind of input. Either way, the idea is that the poles of the system, in other words, the roots of the denominator of the transfer function, determine the stability of the system, and they, perform, they also describe much of the performance of the system. You can think of poles as describing how the internals of a system behave regardless of the input. Zeros are the roots of the numerator of the transfer function, and in fact we already know how to solve for what their effect is, and we'll review those quickly today. Those include the time domain solution, the Laplace transform solution, as well as frequency domain. What's more important though is to understand the effect of zeros, where we said the denominator, the poles, in other words, affect the stability of the system, and what the zeros do is they're going, we're going to show how they affect the response of the system without affecting the stability. And in fact, you can think of zeros as just how many derivatives of the input you have, and we'll show that they can increase the overshoot in the system. Another issue we'll discuss today is causality, which talks about a practical issue of real life, which is that a system has to have at least as many poles as there are zeros. Next, let's consider the time domain solution where one way to do this is to simplify the problem by only applying the unit step on the right-hand side. We already know what that looks like. There's an exponential envelope and there's a sinusoid. And in fact, we can sketch that quite easily. It's going to have a steady state and it's going to have a little bit of oscillation with an exponential decay. We also know how to solve the bigger problem, which includes the derivative here. And having known the step response, all we have to take is the derivative of the step response. It has smaller amplitude, so we multiply by one-fifth, and then here's the overall answer. Notice that even though this system has a derivative, it still has the same sinusoid and has the same exponential decay. It just has different coefficients on these. If we were to plot this, what x of t looks like for the full solution, we would include our x1 of t, plus realize that adding the derivative here, the system has a very high positive slope in the beginning. And so what the effect would be, would be to cause a larger amount of overshoot and then a standard decay. And so what we expect from this system due to the derivative term is to have more overshoot. Here's the same problem using the Laplace transform where we take the transfer function, we multiply by u of s, we do the partial fraction expansion, find the constants, and then we get the same answer in the end. Next, let's consider the issue of causality, which says that this differential equation is actually impossible. The transfer function is s, and so it has more zeros than poles. And if you were to plot the Bode plot, it would look something like this, and the phase would be 90 degrees for all frequencies. This is impossible because, first of all, a pure derivative requires information about the future. Actual systems can't respond instantly, and so they must have a zero or negative phase lag at high frequency. This is just a reality about any kind of system in real life. These requirements are called causality. And mathematically, we've already dealt with some idealizations, such as massless springs. We've also defined the pure impulse function. And similarly, the derivative function is not actually realizable in any true physical system. So these are only approximations of reality. And the rule that uh, causality Im implies is that the number of poles in a system must be greater than or equal to the number of zeros. This doesn't say that we can't 
uh, work for our convenience with s transfer functions such as this. It just means that in real life, they can't actually sustain the positive phase lag over all frequencies. Here's what we've talked about. So far, we mentioned that we can use our regular methods, which you already know, to solve for systems which have derivatives on the right-hand side. And more importantly, we talked about how to understand those systems. That denominator of the transfer function, in other words, the poles, are critical for stability, whereas the zeros can affect the response, but not necessarily the stability. And we said that, in particular, one thing that we often ex experience with derivatives in the input is an increase in overshoot. And then finally, we said that in real life, causality requires the number of poles to be greater than or equal to the number of zeros for any true transfer function.